So Shabana Bazi Rashik was six in 1996 when the Taliban came to power and overnight everything changed. The schools were closed for girls and all of the records, all of the test scores, the fact that they had existed was just burned and destroyed by the Taliban. And her parents were some of the few parents in the country who made a decision that they were going to send their daughter to a secret school. So she went to at least four secret schools. The last one, the fourth one, she remembers the best. Her parents would dress her like a boy and she would go with her big sister. It was far from her house. And her parents would send them out with a little grocery bag with some change in it in case they were stopped they could pretend that's what they were doing. School was a different time every day. The schedule changed so that it wouldn't be so obvious where they were going. And um, the people who were leaving the school were two teachers. They had taught in the schools before they were closed. They had three daughters. Two of them had been in medical school and one just graduated from high school and they couldn't continue their studies, so they were teaching in the secret school. And then there were two little boys who would be lookouts, their sons, who would let them know if, if something seemed awry, if the Taliban was around. And um, some days they would, she would come to the school and the teachers would act like they didn't know her and act like they didn't know them. And they would be, that would be a sign that they should leave immediately and go a different route. And often the teachers would remind them, when you're leaving here, if you should be stopped by the Taliban, take them to your home. Do not bring them back here because fewer people will be killed that way. It's kind of a hard thing to imagine. You know, I think about sending your kid off to school and you're like, uh, look both ways, come straight home, but not like, uh, you know, in case someone tries to kill you, take them to your home, don't bring them here. So her life went on like that, and um, then, of course, you know, five years came. 2001, the United States the allies invaded Afghanistan, and almost overnight again, things changed. And so in March of 2002, the schools were reopened for girls, but all the tests had been burned and destroyed, so all the girls had to retest. So they went to the school, thousands of girls, and they were tested, and then on the first day of school, they were grouped in groups of 60 and 70 um, based on their performance, and the girl who had scored the highest was the representative. So she went on the first day, and the teacher called her forward. And when she came up, the teacher said to her, are you Shabana? And she said, yes, and the teacher said, oh no. And she turned around and looked, and she was 12, and everyone in the class was 18. And she realized then what her parents had done for her all of the time she had gone to this secret school she had thought how can my parents do this to me how can they risk my life and then she had this sense of this is what they have preserved for me is my education and so she ended up being kind of a star student and as things would unfold she came to the united states on an exchange program for high school students and then she went to middlebury college kind of prestigious school in vermont and when she was there, it was kind of the first time she'd ever met people who, as she would describe, took their education for granted. And she would kind of try to explain what she'd been through and no one seemed to understand. And she said she knew parents didn't like it when their kids took things for granted, but she always thought of that as a high water mark. It'll be a great day when the girls in Afghanistan don't remember this, don't remember being threatened. But she felt so privileged, the gift of an education, and somewhere she heard that little thing that only 6% of women in the world ever have a college education. So she decided at the age of 19 that she would return to Afghanistan and she would start her own school. So she started this school, slowly of course, but then by 2016, SOLA, the School of Leadership in Afghanistan, was founded and it was um, a boarding school, the only boarding school in the entire country. And that first year filled with sixth grade girls. And every year the school would get bigger and they would add more. And um, this past year, the most successful, 100 girls from 28 of the 34 provinces. And you know, we think of such a rural country and one girl goes back to the village and over the break, she begins to educate all of the girls they were looking forward to an incredible 2022. They had more applications than ever, like 260 from 30 of the 34 provinces. Her heart was just so full, giving TED Talks and all of this. And then, of course, everything began to change. She knew last year or two, one day a father came to her from a faraway village. He'd walked very far, 
begging her to take his daughter as a student. His other daughters were already married off. She would be the hope. She would be the only girl. She would come back and educate the village. And then when he was leaving, after he handed Shabana his daughter's application, he said, promise me this, though. When the Taliban return, promise me you'll burn my daughter's record and all the records here so she will be safe. And then this July, when they went on break, a couple of the sisters went back to their village. Their grandmother met them, happy, rejoicing. And then she gave each one of the girls a scythe, you know, the long handled instrument for harvesting with the sharp blade on the end. And the grandmother told the girls, if the Taliban should come for you, waste no time, take your own life. Promise me this. And the girls promised. And then the grandmother put them in the burqa and sent them back to the school. We can't even process that, right? This idea of, of being so afraid of needing to escape. But it's not altogether rare. I think if you Google it, there's 82 million refugees right now on the planet. So many other people who've been refugees at time, right? And then in our own country, we have some people who've been separated and had to flee because of climate issues. Even if they're resolved, they change their home forever. And then in smaller ways, we have our own experiences too of being dislocated or feeling the need to be delivered or escape. We've got people in our own church right now who are kind of doubled over in physical pain from a back that just won't heal. And we've got some kind of rolled up in a ball from emotional stuff. And we've got people just going through regular lifestyle things like having to take their beloved who can no longer be in the home and put them into long-term care. And we just have our own stuff, right? And that might be why the scriptures are so much about escape and deliverance. If you try to think about it, like what children's story in the Bible, what Bible story in that Hebrew Bible oh, is not about escape and deliverance. It's pretty much the whole thing, right? From Adam and Eve dealing with their shame to the great flood, Noah and the ark, to Jonah and the well, Daniel and the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the fiery furnace, Queen Esther delivering her people, the whole thing is about escape and deliverance. My Hebrew Bible professor in seminary always said, scripture, three things. God is with us. God sees that which binds us and wants to deliver us from it. And God holds out a future of hope. Every single story, the big stories, Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Esau and Joseph, they're all trying to deal with their own stuff with their family and trying to move away and not be damaged. And then the biggest story, right? The people are enslaved. And God does what? God delivers them. God leads them from Pharaoh and then caught parts the Red Sea and they're delivered. And then all of the Jewish holidays and celebrations, Passover, what is that a story about? Deliverance. Again, you gather in your home, you gather around your table, you open the Haggadah, you practice telling the story again. And now we're in another Jewish holiday of deliverance and celebration, Sukkot. It's not as familiar to us, but it comes at the end of the Jewish high holidays, which move around this year, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year was right at Labor Day. And then 10 years, 10 days later, after 10 days of atoning and saying you'll do better, then you have Yom Kippur, right? Which is the day of atonement. You say, I'm gonna do better, you celebrate. And then five days later, Sukkot. And you may have seen your Jewish sisters and brothers in their own sukkah, the word sukkah, it means a booth or a tent. And it's this celebration where you remember what God has done for you. You remember that God delivered you. And when you lived in the wilderness, you just um, lived in this little temporary tent. So our Jewish sisters and brothers kind of put these tents in their backyard. And they're, you know, like stakes. And then they're kind of on three sides, netting. And then the top is supposed to be made of something like a palm frond or bamboo. So Tuesday... My dear friend Rabbi Albert had our Torah group over to study in their Sukkot, in their Sukkah, which um, is a great time because he's an incredible cook. So four of us sat there in this, on this cool Tuesday morning. If you remember, Tuesday was really cool. And the wind just blew through it. And together, these dear friends, all of us struggling, trying to lead congregations, we talked about what it means that God brings us into this new land and then God commands us not to build a six bedroom house with a security system, but this temporary little shelter that's shaky and humble and precarious 
And it's a sign that so are our lives, all of those things, right? That they're never completely firm, that they're this kind of, you know, transient, impermanent, fragile little place. And you see that again in the Jewish life cycle, you know, how a couple are married under the chuppah, under a little tent, right? It's a reminder that we have our houses, but what we really have is one another and one another's love and this promise that God will deliver us. So I was thinking about that this week. A good friend of mine, kind of going through a rough patch, he's a doctor. He's a phenomenal person. And I remember years ago, 30 years maybe, when we were young and he was just starting off his practice, chief resident, incredible guy, and he lost his first patient. And everybody knows, doctor knows, that's something you gotta learn, right? You're gonna lose some people. He loved these people. He'd been close to the family and he grieved. But then six months later, the lawsuit, and he was just devastated. I mean, the de being deposed, all of it. And like most of our doctors, not quick to go to a psychiatrist, but after four days of not sleeping, he sat in front of the psychiatrist and he, the psychiatrist said, what are you here for? And he said, I want to be in a stable place, a stable state, a stable condition. And the psychiatrist said, yeah, well, there's really no such thing as that. <laughs> you know, that all of life is change and it's moving about and it's just dealing with it all, right? Or I thought again of um, just another situation with another friend um, who's going through such a, such a time of just everything being tossed about and turned about. And what does it mean that we're just called in a way to live in our own little flimsy structures and to be reminded that, you know, the reason we put up this sukkah with our Jewish sisters and brothers is to give thanks that God brought us forth before to celebrate that and to remind ourselves that God will bring us forward again, that we'll make our way out of this, that we'll figure out a way to deal with Christmas Eve, right? That we'll find a way to have theater and to celebrate and to party and we'll find a way to create a new world from this one. This is just a temporary place right now. So Shabana and Sola, the School of Leadership in Afghanistan, found themselves late this summer not celebrating their biggest class, but really trying to figure out how they could escape, how they could be delivered, how they could survive. And Shabana's first thought was, she would send all the girls home with a tablet, right? With a laptop and their cell phone. And they would have a virtual classroom wherever they went. But you know, it's not really having that, right? In that country right now. And she realized, you know, the power grids are being attacked and the infrastructure, and you send these girls off. And before you know it, they're married off. You'll never see them again, best case. And so they decided the best thing to do was to try to leave the country with these girls. And what makes the most sense, some of the six surrounding countries, right? Pakistan, Tajikistan. But the problem, of course, so many people trying to get out, there was no welcome, no welcome mat for them. So it was that in late August, Shabana and the girls, 250 in total, the, ch the children and the students and some, some family members, left to begin their school in Rwanda, where the president, who knew a little bit about a little bit about struggle and pain and refugee and warring factions, welcome them with open arms. I can't wrap my head around that. I mean, we gather here every Sunday and I look at my teachers here and we talk about the classrooms and we think about the parents sending their kids off and all the people are trying to deal with, right, with COVID and with virtual classrooms. Can you really imagine Rwanda? Like, Afghanistan, they're not, they're not like next door. I'm thinking about this courageous woman who is seeing this as a study abroad, <laughs> as a study abroad experience <laughs> that will take those girls to a deeper, richer place, right? That will call them like every study abroad to like find out who you really are. Put yourself in a new culture, expose yourself and learn and grow. What if we could imagine the season that we're going into as our own study abroad, right? This school year, this opportunity to really like let go of some of the crap 
that God knows we need to let go of and has been dragging us down and dragging the people around us for too long. I mean, what if we just decided this is my year and this is my time and I'm going to offer it up and I'm going to believe this God who brought the people through slavery, who led Dr. King, right? That God, that God is even now calling us forward to a fresh new home. May this beautiful world we live in that is so shaky and so humble and so precarious, but also so beautiful, welcome us on the journey. Amen.